people need to get over slavery. All right, so I guess I started off. I mean, <laughs> we all know that slavery was a terrible thing. Yes. It was an atrocity. Right. It was a human tragedy. But yes. we can't just be talking about slavery every day. It ended in 1865. This is 2020. Mm -hmm. We got to press forward. Our ancestors, they went through a lot. They died for us to be able to be here right now. Yes. And the best country on planet Earth. Yes. Take advantage of what we have right now, right. rather than looking in the past and saying, oh, well, what was me because of slavery? Right. You know, there have been other groups of people in slavery mm -hmm. all throughout the world. They can't just stay in that state. So people, a lot of times, they stay right in their place and others are being able to pass them because mentally they've moved on while others have not. They constantly use slavery to put them in a victim mentality. We can't accomplish this because you enslaved my ancestors. Slaves were taught English. Slaves were taught how to become managers and secretaries and cooks and um, chauffeurs and uh, how to build water tanks and all sorts of things. We, we're here now. Okay, I'm not gonna cap with y'all. I have a very visceral kind of reaction when I hear and see takes like this. And by visceral, I mean I want to manually extract the viscera of the person saying it. Get a dictionary if your vocab game is lacking. I personally don't think that the systematic and institutionalized dehumanization and exploitation of one group of people specifically for the benefit of a different group of people with no justification other than, ah, niggers. It's something you can just get over. That being said, I'm not going to lie and say that I don't get kind of weary of the we was Kangs talk coming from people who don't do much more during the course of a day than get high and then finesse their baby and our own mama stimulus check into an Xbox and a copy of 2K and Call of Duty before I work in the graveyard shift at Wendy's. And if you ever wanted to know why the spicy nuggets in your 4 for 4 always seem to taste suspiciously like a reefer dookie, there you have it. This is because I feel like at some point you just gotta learn to play the hand you're dealt, even if it's a garbage one. Why waste time stressing over something that can't be changed anyway? I feel like that's what people mean when they say it's time to just move on from slavery, and I mean, I get that. That being said, for those of you who do fall into that camp, just hear me out for a minute. It's actually quite difficult to fully measure the price of slavery when you sit down and try to crunch the numbers. I mean, we can use the human toll as a point of reference to start. It's estimated that between 1501 and 1866, something like 12 and a half million Africans were transported to the Americas via Amistad to either make the white man rich or make the white man nut. or more than likely both. But more than two million wound up being the chum bucket value meal somewhere between here and the motherland, sometimes willfully so. We can estimate how much profit a population of six million unpaid workers generated over the course of 250 years and use that as a basis of our argument. We can quite persuasively argue that America's status as one of the world's wealthiest economies for like the past 200 years and one of, if not the world superpower for the last 80-ish years wouldn't have even been possible without those millions of free man hours keeping those southern cash crops cropping, those northern mills and factories stocked with raw materials from the south, and all those East Coast port cities that Midwestern whites can't distinguish from Sodom and Gomorrah bustling with imports and exports. We can always go the emotional distress route, which I mean seems to always work wonders in small claims court, but none of those factors alone I think would do justice to the inhumanity that was the transatlantic slave trade. First of all, we have to dispel some quite easily debunkable yet still commonly held lies about American slavery. No, it was not just like slavery in the Bible, you freaking idiot. I did a whole video last year on how, for its time, the Mosaic Law and its provisions on slavery were considered revolutionary for the time by many scholars. That being said, slavery in a general sense in the ancient world was not nearly as brutal as what you saw on Django. Case in point being the surprisingly common practice of selling one's family or even self into slavery as a means of debt relief. 
My point being, no matter how many tens of thousands you still owe the Great Lakes borrowers, I'm willing to bet my Y chromosome that you take your chances with the bill collectors if the alternative were death by Mandingo fight. Don't get it twisted. A slave's life in the ancient or colonial world was not easy like guarding Ben Simmons anywhere past the free throw line. That being said, they weren't the same kind of hard. Think the difference between base game Bloodborne hard and using the Guitar Hero controller during New Game Plus or from cause fight hard. First off, believe it or not, in the ancient world, you typically weren't allowed to just beat your slave within an inch of life and just buy a new one with your tax refund. There were social and even legal limitations that prevented you from doing that. But again, just how harshly you could treat your slave was relative to what country, region, or even city-state you resided in. In the ancient world, it was not out of the ordinary for a slave to actually be successful beyond successfully avoiding forced amputation. Slaves in the ancient world weren't just field workers and glorified concubines, after all. Some worked as freelancers and didn't live with their masters. Rather, they just worked for their master in the master's shop or business. And records even survive of slaves running businesses unsupervised. Slaves could also work as public servants, while others did domestic work. Some slave classes, like the Turkish Janissaries, actually held significant socio-political status within their society, despite, you know, technically still being owned by someone else. Additionally, both the Greeks and Romans practiced manumission, which encouraged slaves to earn their own money on the side that they could use to eventually purchase their own freedom and even start their free life fairly well off. But Billiam, the southern slave owners did the exact same thing. Have you ever heard of Chicken George? While the practice did exist in the American South, the scale was nowhere near that of ancient Roman Greece because in the ancient Greco-Roman world, slavery was primarily an economic institution, nothing more than a means to keep the machine running smoothly. Thus, slave masters were much more likely to recognize they'd be better served to encourage their slaves to seek emancipation at some point than to just hold on to a depreciating asset just because, ah, nurse. And this brings me to the primary difference between ancient and American slavery. Ancient slavery was not race-based because race wasn't nearly as big a deal in ancient Greece and Rome as it became in medieval Europe and most definitely in 17th century Virginia. Divisions in the ancient world weren't really based on skin color as much as they were on what tribe and or region you came from. So... Gang banging. This is why a huge and probably the biggest chunk of the slave population of that time came from POWs. People weren't going out of their way to fight and enslave people whose skin was darker than theirs. Whoever just so happened to be on the other side of the battlefield, whether they looked, dressed, or even spoke the same way as you did, could be a prospective Deborah Grayson. The slave populations of the ancient Greco-Roman world were multicultural, lingual, and yes, colored. This is a big reason why slave rebellions during that time were so far and few in between. The American slave population, on the other hand, was comprised of one race of people. Granted, a multicultural and lingual one, but as far as their masters were concerned, you might as well just call it all nourish. But Billiam, no! Before you even fix your lips to say it, there were never any Irish, Scottish, Welsh, or any other ethnically white slaves in America. But none, zero, zilch, nada, got it? The only non-black Americans who can claim to have descended from slaves are native ones, the real ones, not these idiots. But even that's dubious because those walking petri dishes called colonizers wiped out the lion's share of the indigenous population and thereby the workforce with smallpox, thus necessitating the transatlantic slave trade. The closest white people ever became to being slaves in America, aside from now, were the indentured servant population that was comprised of poor whites from the British Isles. But again, we're talking about two completely different things here. For one thing, indentured servitude wasn't race-based, but economic. Indentured servants were made either through debt relief, punishment for crime, or apprenticeship. Or just for a free ride to the new world, properly to get out of a debt, punishment, or apprenticeship. My point being, you had a choice. But most importantly, a contract of indentured servitude was temporary and agreed upon prior to that service, 
usually something like seven years. Again, not like slavery. But Billiam, what about all the Africans who sold their own people into slavery, huh? Yeah, you really didn't hear what I said earlier about the gangbanging thing, did you? There's a ton of different ethnic and linguistic groups in West Africa and literally thousands of tribes. Nigeria alone has like 500. You know how Northern and regular Ireland have been going back and forth firebombing each other's pubs for like 100 years even though they're all like first cousins or something like that? Or how Korea has been two separate countries for like 70 years? Or how basically every Hispanic ethnic group hates every other Hispanic ethnic group because... Hell, I don't know, baseball probably. My point is race is not the end-all, be-all of unifiers or dividers for that matter. And for someone to suggest as much, well, says more about you than anything else now, doesn't it? Race was literally the only justification European colonizers had for subjugating an entire continent of people, either by forcibly removing a large chunk of its population and thus workforce to some backwoods farm in the middle of nowhere, or by sucking the continent dry of its natural resources by using the local indigenous population as free labor. I mean, there is something to be said for consistency, right? And that's the thing, isn't it? Just because slavery ended, it didn't mean the mentality that justified it in the first place died along with it. If anything, you could argue that the end of slavery just intensified the small dick energy behind the lost cause society of the American Southland. Contrary to popular and wrong opinion, the American Civil War was not fought to free the slaves. It was started to keep slavery intact, but that's a different thing entirely. Lincoln said himself that if he could preserve the Union without freeing one tar baby, he would. Though he personally opposed slavery, he didn't think that black people being forced against their will to work for rich white folks was big enough an issue for poor white people to die over. Because Lincoln, much like 95% of white Americans at the time, believed that white people were inherently superior to blacks because, I don't know, science or some shit. When most southern states ceded from the Union, they made it clear in their Articles of Secession that they were doing so to preserve white supremacy via slavery. Contrary to another popular myth, one that I was actually taught as fact in middle school, blacks didn't serve in the Confederate Army. Well... Not until the war was basically lost anyway and every able-bodied white man was either already fighting or dead. Because black people actually proving themselves just as, if not more competent fighters than their white squad mates kind of defeats the whole purpose of the war in the first place, right? My point is, it wasn't economics, but black people's supposed inferiority to whites that served to justify them being exploited and oppressed for the benefit of white people. But Billiam, my ancestors never owned slaves. In fact, only a small percentage of white southerners ever owned any slaves, and an even smaller percentage owned enough to run a plantation. How do you explain that? Huh? 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 Which makes the whole just get over it argument that much stupider. Rich whites figured out that if they gave poor ones even a whiff of the power they had, they could exploit them into keeping the slave population in check. Because even today, rich people know that when a person is too busy looking down on somebody else, they won't bother to look up to see who's pissing on their own head. And with that philosophy in mind, America's elite has created basically every domestic policy from Reconstruction all the way to today. So even if slavery did end two centuries ago, the spirit of it lives on. The ugliest, harshest, most inconvenient truth about the U.S. is that its laws, institutions, even its society were all built on a foundation of white supremacy. What I mean by that is the U.S. from the jump was intended to be a place where white people could prosper directly at the expense of black and brown people. And that's because the people who made the colonial economy run literally could not afford to think of black and brown skins as anything more than subhuman at best. Jokes aside though, we actually have more than enough resources to reverse the legacy of American slavery, with or without reparations, even though I mean... The real question is, who actually cares enough to do that? I frankly could not care less about some dry dick hillbilly Trump humper getting his feelings hurt over his privilege being called out for what it is and better yet the reason and cause behind it. 
What I do care about is America, the supposed moral center of the free world, reconciling its trespasses with those it trespassed against by rectifying the effects of every single law and institution created to perpetuate white supremacy in this country. And for the record, I'll take mine in cash check or money order because daddy needs to cop these new Air Max Utoniums ASAP.